Hey, welcome to EPN. My name is Victor Lucas. We'll be bringing the latest in everything cool every single day. We've got an incredible EP live for you today. Thank you so much for joining us. And I also want to thank everybody that I met at Fan Expo Vancouver. It was an impromptu visit. I didn't really have a lot of time to kind of, you know, hype up the fact that I was going to be down there, but I got to hang out with uh, uh, Metropolis Comics and Toys, which is right out by uh, Metro Town in, uh, in the Vancouver Burnaby area. They had a booth and they uh, welcomed me with open arms and I met quite a few people which was really cool and uh, some people picked up some shirts and I asked them to send me pictures so we may be taking a look at a few of those a little bit later but right now it's time to get going with the rundown exploring the old west and red dead redemption 2 is probably going to keep you busy all winter. The main story campaign in the new Cowboy game is reportedly more than 65 hours long. That's according to New York Magazine, which in a new interview with Rockstar Games co-founder Dan Hauser estimated the playtime after seeing the game's massive voice acting script. It's unclear how many side missions and world exploration is included in that estimate, but either way, this would make Red Dead Redemption 2 the longest Rockstar game ever. All that hard work takes time. In the same story, Dan Hauser confirms that the game has been in development ever since the last Red Dead game came out in 2010 with many members of the team working 100-hour weeks during the crunch time over the last year. Rockstar has been criticized for overworking their employees in the past, but there's no denying that they make some of the best games in the world. Red Dead Redemption 2 lands a week from Friday, and I read that uh, wonderful story from Harold Goldberg who put this all together. He's a terrific guy, a veteran in the video game industry, and I was so jealous that he had so much access to the Rockstar folks. Um, I interviewed Dan Hauser, I think, for Grand Theft Auto 3, and that's the last I've seen of the Hauser brothers, you know, because they've gotten so successful with their franchises and they are at the top of their class, you know. They really understood the value of the interactive medium and storytelling and creating mystery and uh, creating, uh, I guess, a hype of sort of value or, you know, you can kind of see that the hype is going to be worth it with their products. They really take the time to make these things stories with incredible characters and, um, you know, moments that you're going to remember forever. There's resonance in all of their work. And one of the things that I did find interesting in that article, good job, Harold, is uh, that they really moved away from casting known actors. They really feel like they get a more authentic sound from hiring people that people aren't really familiar with uh, and then they become these characters and they're I guess a little bit more malleable they have less ego and stuff they brought up uh, some kind of a confrontation that uh, one of the Hauser brothers had with Burt Reynolds which I thought was pretty funny uh, but yeah man I can't wait that date is coming up very soon and I'm going to be juggling a lot of stuff. I'm going to be super busy because I'm in Toronto next week working um, with the Escapist show. Uh, but I'll be piping in some uh, rundowns for you uh, while I'm on the road. But, uh, oh man, I can't believe that Red Dead Redemption 2 is almost here. It looks like abandoning single player hasn't hurt the Call of Duty franchise at all. The latest entry, Black Ops 4, is already the fastest selling game in the franchise's history. Sort of. Activision claims that the new game, which was just released on Friday, was the best selling day one release on on both the PlayStation Network and Xbox Live, giving it the best digital launch in history. They haven't revealed how well it's sold in brick-and-mortar stores, which makes it impossible to compare to other Call of Duty games, so this could just signal a trend towards digital distribution. Still, this is good news for Call of Duty and Activision. There was some doubt about how successful the new game would be, given that it drops the traditional single-player campaign in favor of online-only content, so it looks like the franchise won't be hurting as a result. I was playing a little bit over the weekend, and I have been enjoying my time with it, but yes, I can already confirm that I miss the crazy single-player campaigns that the uh, Black Ops titles are known for, but I really like the Blackout mode. It is really, really fun. It doesn't really deviate all that much from, uh, you know, the other Battle Royale experiences that are out there, sort of in general terms, uh, but it's it's fun. It's just really fun. It's easy to play, and, and uh, uh, the competition is fierce, and you feel like you're a badass by just sort of, uh, you know, hiding somewhere for a little while until, poof, you're dead. Start again. Uh, but yeah, I think it's cool. I'll definitely have a review for you as soon as humanly possible, but uh, I'm playing it, and I'm digging it. It looks like Nintendo is ready to embrace change with the Switch. They've announced a new special edition version of the console based around Diablo 3, which hits the system next month. It doesn't have anything new under the hood, but does have cool Diablo branded artwork on the outside, similar to the Super Smash Bros. Ultimate version of the system landing in December. The bundle also comes with the game, obviously, and a Diablo branded carrying case. 
in Canada, it will set you back 450 bucks and will only be available at EB Games. Looking ahead, Nintendo is rumored to be working on a redesigned Switch 2.0 that will have better hardware, although don't expect to hear any official announcements about that until at least next year. Uh, I think this is cool. We're going to have branded Switch consoles out there. I think it's crazy that there is a Diablo Nintendo machine. Who would have called that? I mean, it's a great fit, and I can't wait to play Diablo on the Switch, but who would have called... Because I think Diablo is still an M-rated game, is it not? I think it is, but it, it's just such a crazy idea that there is a, uh, a game set in hell that's on a Nintendo platform, and you can have all of that artwork etched all over it. I think we're going to see a lot more of this. I think that the uh, the Switch is a modular machine, and I think there's going to be some interesting, um, you know, permutations of the device as it exists now. And yes, for sure, we will get an enhanced Switch down the road. Absolutely count on it. The Switch is just a, it's a solid, uh, you know, kind of new salvo for Nintendo. What is it? What is going to be very interesting is to hear what the plans are for any kind of a portable solution going forward. Perhaps what we kind of know as the 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 switch um you know, uh, tech specs as they exist today are going to evolve into an, uh, a, a handheld only version of the machine that will play these carts and the downloaded software, but it'll be priced a little bit cheaper. Maybe it'll have a little bit of a smaller screen or something, but it will have the same hardware specs uh, that exist right now. That way, developers could, um, you know, have their games exist in multiple different formats, but not have to create. Uh, a brand new piece of code or a brand new piece of software up there. They would just have to kind of scale up to the top end of what whatever the Switch 2.0 ends up being. Um, interesting days for Nintendo. This is what happens when you have massive success. You just have to, uh, you kind of have to live with your success and roll with all of the new challenges that they present. All right, it turns out that the immortal Iron Fist wasn't so immortal after all. The superhero show has officially been canceled after two seasons. Marvel and Netflix haven't revealed why they've killed the series, although it was never as popular with audiences as the other Defender shows like Daredevil and Jessica Jones. And since the cancellation is coming just a month after the second season, it's a safe bet that the numbers just weren't there. The good news for Iron Fist fans is that Marvel and Netflix say that while the series on Netflix has ended, the immortal Iron Fist will live on. That means we could see the character pop up in other shows, and there will obviously be new comics and other stories down the road. Marvel and Netflix may have just watched my review of season one and two as well and said, ah, that's it. No, I'm, I'm kidding. I just reviewed it, and people have been tweeting me and saying, look, the show's canceled. See what you did? And uh, yeah, the show was not good. And I've been thinking about what they could do with Iron Fist. They could make it like a 70s exploitation kind of show with lots of sort of saturated colors and a lot of pop. And the villains could have weapons that aren't just traditional handguns and, and swords, but they could have badass powers, you know, alien-infused weapons or something to kind of counteract the, uh, the supernatural elements that Iron Fist kind of embodies. And I would like to see him in the costume, and I would like to see him be a superhero and just, you know, kapow! Almost like The Last Dragon. Remember The Last Dragon movie from the... Nobody remembers that. But it was it was a good uh, cult film, and it had a sense of humor and cool characters. And with, uh, with the... You know, they wouldn't even have to recast. They just kind of retool and, and sort of embrace it. They kind of lean in that direction a little bit at the very end of season two, because it, it sort of cranks up the cheese ball a little bit. Um, but we don't know these characters as that, you know? And I think that might have been part of the problem with the way that it, Iron Fist was framed with Daredevil and Jessica Jones and Luke. Because all of those other shows are a little dour and dark and uh, twisted and depressive a little bit. And they fit those heroes. But with Iron Fist, this is a guy that should have kind of like a Buddhist kind of... Uh, uh, you know, center and a little bit of an appreciation for his ability to, you know, reinvest into society and have fun with it. You know, that was the biggest problem with Iron Fist. It just wasn't fun. And, uh, you, you know, if they work him into the to the series again or if they retool and they build something new or uh, the other rumor is that Disney's going to launch a, an Iron Fist show on um, on their streaming service, uh, I just hope it's more fun. The character can be fun. And they can also just make a Heroes for Hire show and put Luke Cage and Iron Fist together and make that fun, too. Uh, but listen, uh, I I'm not terribly sad to see Iron Fist go. <laughs> All right, guys, that's going to do it for our rundown today. Thank you so much for watching that. Now it's time to move on to this day and everything cool.
Welcome to This Day and Everything Cool for October 15th. On this day in 1992, the gaming industry entered a whole new era. Sega released the Sega CD in North America following its release in Japan the previous year. It was an add-on for the existing Sega Genesis and was one of the first home consoles to run games off CD-ROMs instead of traditional cartridges. Sega had been looking to create a CD add-on for the Genesis ever since the system launched, seeing it as a way to stay ahead of their biggest rival, Nintendo. CDs were seen as the next big step in gaming, they made making games much easier for developers in many significant ways, not the least of which was the expansion in storage that allowed games to be bigger. They also could run video files, which led to an entire library of games using full motion video for the Sega CD, like Mad Dog McCree and the infamous Night Trap. CDs also have disadvantages though, most notably loading times, with machines needing a bit of time to access new parts of the disc. The Sega CD was only a moderate success, but CDs themselves went on to dominate dominate the industry for decades to come. All right, you guys, we have two very special guests on the show today, and I want to uh, give a big thank you to Twitter for being useful for some things other than posting uh, animated GIFs and stuff. Uh, <laughs> you can actually reach out to people that you know in various communities. I reached out to Justin Richmond, and he said, uh, sure, he'd come on the show to talk about uh, The Dragon Prince, which is the, a brand new animated series that has uh, just launched on Netflix, and he brought his co-creator uh, ally with him, Aaron Ehaz, and we're going to find out all about uh, the Dragon Prince today, but I, I want to ask how you guys know each other, because Justin Richmond, you're from the video game industry, but now you're making um, animated works. <laughs> That's right. Aaron, Aaron and I met um, at Riot Games. Um, Aaron, you were, he was a creative director. Mm -hmm. I was creative director at Riot. And, 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 and then you recruited We were recruiting me. that guy in, and <laughs> yeah. then we got to know each other, and we just, we connected really, really well over creative ideas and characters and talking about storytelling and talking about games we loved and stuff like that and uh, just stayed connected. Yeah. And just gelled. And awesome. then oh, we have a, a third partner at Wonderstorm, Justin Santa Stevens. We all met at Riot um, yeah. in the in the R&D department. Very cool. So uh, so then uh, there's a lot of video game background uh, at Wonderstorm, which is your production company, but also on this show. Yeah. So Wonderstorm, we, the three of us founded it. Um, with the idea of making shows, games and shows at the same time, mm -hmm. um, like doing both things at exactly the same time. Um, and Justin is a, he's probably the biggest gamer I know, which is saying something like every picture he showed me of when I first met him was like, here's me when I was six getting like Super Mario 3 and just like <laughs> losing his mind. And he has like that picture every year for years. He's like, yeah. he's a crazy gamer. Uh, awesome. My guess is he's playing a video game right now. <laughs> if I had to go, I wouldn't call it. Fun. <laughs> he's yeah, he's not here. He's playing a game right now. Yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> well, that's uh, super cool. So, so yeah. So and then our whole staff, um, well, not our whole staff, but many of our staff came from Riot or from the video game industry, and so we have a huge cross disciplinary staff yeah. that love both shows. And games. I mean, even even the show team. Yeah. Everyone who's working on the show team at Wonderstorm uh spent years working in games most most of whom at riot yeah and that's how we originally connected that is incredible i i don't imagine there are too many studios like yours out there period i don't think so i mean i think we're, yeah <laughs> yeah go ahead. certainly not with this goal right most yeah. i think most studios start off and they're making one or the other yeah and we had both been in a position kind of on both sides of that so i had originally seen that when i worked on avatar the last airbender and nickelodeon yeah. And they were like, okay, cool, we have this show, we have this audience, how do we build a video game? And then at Riot and other places, you often, you have this game, you yeah. you, you ran into this with Uncharted. Yeah. We have this phenomenon and this audience, now how do we do storytelling? Yeah, how do we make a movie? And so, so often we've seen it kind of start on one side and they try to build the other. And we've seen kind of some of the pitfalls and problems and we were like, people who love games also, also love storytelling and, and they want that part of the characters in the world. And we thought, well, how could you do it right? And we, we think, it's by building a team who that's their goal from from the outset is to build storytelling and gameplay from the same world and the same kind of uh, ideas. And so that's what we're trying to do at Wonderstorm. Yeah, that's awesome. You're not really looking at it as um, two separate things. And video games no. aren't like the, uh, the the bastard sort of uh, beach, to beach towel licensed thing at the that's end. That's right. Actually, right? I mean, so yeah, we, we very much believe in it's not a licensed product that if you just found the game, it should be an amazing game by itself. And then hopefully you're like, oh, cool, there's a show for this, or vice versa. You found the show, you're like, oh, it's a great show. Oh, there's a video game? Awesome. And it should feel like 
it's all in the same world and the same characters and all that kind of stuff. They should feel very organic to each oh, other. Oh, fantastic. Well, well, let's uh, tell the people that don't know anything about The Dragon Prince what the concept is for the show. And by the way, I'm loving it. I, I will have a review for you guys soon. I have not uh, finished it, and I don't want these guys to spoil anything uh, <laughs> okay. of the first season. Uh, but break it down for us. What is The Dragon Prince about? You, why don't you all right. do it? Yeah. Um, so it's... It's the story of uh, two young princes and the assassin who was sent to kill them uh, who end up on a journey together to try and stop an enormous war at like the very high level. That's what it's about. But it's a fantasy epic. Um, it is, we hope, something that both kids and adults can enjoy together. And in fact, we've gotten many stories of binge cheating right. <laughs> about this where like in both directions yeah, exactly. where <laughs> families start start the dragon prince together but then one of the my favorite is like the dad who woke up to make breakfast yeah. for their kids at 6 30 yeah and the both his his son and daughter had woken up at like five and were like four episodes ahead he was like, what are you guys doing yeah. like, you yeah, can't exactly. do this to me yeah so, so but we've heard a lot of stories about binge cheating yeah, so binge yeah, watching is a first. thing and now it's binge cheating is a new yeah, phenomenon exactly <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly um so yeah we think it's we think it's something that like all sort of all ages can like and enjoy and find something so there's nothing that's inappropriate for a kid but that there's really deep moral um themes and things like that that, that older people can latch on to well, you don't shy away from some pretty heavy themes i mean you've got uh, you know a group of assassins these elves that are out to kill a king because of ages of uh uh, you know, backstory and uh, a conflict between these two races. And there's a whole bunch of, I won't get into too many details. I won't spoil <laughs> it for you. But uh, I, you, you feel the gravitas of those moments. You feel like the Thank weight you. of people, they're about to lose things and kids having to kind of like suck it up and, and uh, you know, adventure off really freaked out and scared. But it, it's powerful storytelling. I was really Thank impressed. You. Thank you very much. I mean, like, well, I mean, hopefully, oh, well, go ahead. You're going to say something. What was I going to say? Yeah. Oh, I was just going to say, you know, we think kids and people who are growing up are capable of understanding and being affected by much more powerful stories than I think a lot of maybe companies have given them credit for in the yeah. past few decades. So for we sure. never believe in dumbing it down. We, we believe our audience is really intelligent and really capable of understanding big emotional things, but we also stay aware that there's going to be seven-year-olds out there. So we're not right. going to be gory, but yeah. there's going to be death. There's going to be loss. There's going to be yeah. treachery. You know, real things are going to happen. It's just not going to happen in a way that's going to violate the sensibility of a younger audience. Yeah. Well, I love the agency that you give the kids in this as well. Like there's there's a specific line in the, in the show uh, sort of relating to Ezrin, which really hits home as well, you know, and, and uh, uh, his power and his ability. And I guess that's part of it too. And are these lessons you learned, Aaron, through uh, the working on Avatar? Um, yeah, I think, I mean, I think Avatar, we were encouraged to kind of push the boundaries of the storytelling we were doing by uh, Nickelodeon and the executives there at the time. And we, you know, for Avatar, I always just kind of thought, what, what, what was I, what would I have been obsessed with when I was 11, right? Like what would I have yearned for and was just trying to craft a story that 11 year old me could have been obsessed with. And so, um, cause you know, you at that age, especially you're kind of starting to outgrow kids content and you're looking for something, something that's kind of, kind of deeper, something you can sink your teeth into. And so, um, but your, you know, your imagination is still really important and fantasy is still a part of what you want in storytelling. So you're starting to want kind of deeper characters and, and real emotional stories that, that resonate as authentic, but you still want like robots or magic right, or something right, yeah, too, yeah. right? So yeah. that's awesome. awesome fight sequences. Yeah. Well, Justin, w w with uh, your work on the Uncharted series, I think you got a firsthand look at how important story could be for gameplay <laughs> as well, right? And yes. how, how much... Uh, we as players have all been craving that kind of connection for a long time. Any lessons from your Naughty Dog days being yeah, applied I mean, here? I'll tell you this, like, um, it, it's something, there is something very freeing about working on a purely narrative product, uh, <laughs> which I've said to him before. It's like, well, when we're doing Uncharted, you know, it's like, okay, there's this awesome cutscene, and we know where these cutscenes go. And then we got to fill in the like 30 minutes of gameplay in between. And we got to make sure that it's awesome and it feels organic to the story and stuff. And so there's something very freeing about being like, what if we just wrote 22 pages of stuff and then that happens, you know? <laughs> um, but in terms of narratively, I think there's like, 
tricks and stuff that that we talked about that on Uncharted. And then when I came, when I met Aaron, he was like describing the exact same philosophy or tricks. I was like, oh, it's just universal, you know, um, for for great storytelling techniques. I think uh, Amy and and Aaron actually share some some DNA somewhere way back in terms of how they think about story. And so, <laughs> not uh, literally, with both of them has been been hugely rewarding. Not literally. You're not you're not re- revealing not something. No, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> we love we love Amy. Yeah, Amy's story. the best. Oh, exactly. She's amazing. Um, I, I'm I'm curious about um, you guys wrote I think eight of the nine episodes of the first season, right? Or we most of them? Seven of the nine. I seven. Think, I think seven. Yeah, like close, a, yeah. were credited. But yeah. what, what was your question? Well, I'm curious. Like, why didn't you just do all of them? <laughs> That's a lot of work. But why <laughs> didn't? Fair. Yeah. yeah. We have an excellent writing team. Okay. So even though you see like our writing credit on more of those episodes, it means we we took the first crack at the draft. Oh, gotcha. But we have a team of. Um, are we gonna be in yeah, trouble here? Yeah, hold on. I'm just gonna hop off camera while he's talking. We want to make sure we don't lose batteries. Yeah, hold on. Okay, so, gotcha. Um, we we really approach storytelling in a collaborative way. We have um, one of the first writers who joined us, Devin Geel, who's someone we worked with at Riot, who's a young, talented writer who's now. Turing is a very talented and, and uh, able writer, contributed to all these stories from the beginning and developing the world with us. Um, it's part of how we test our characters and test the storytelling too, is that instead of just dreaming it up and writing it down, we, we talk about it a lot, right? We, we expose cool. it to everyone's kind of rigorous, you know, does that make sense? Would that work? Is that surprising? Is it so surprising that it seems like BS? You know, we kind of want to find that balance. So we have we have a collaborative process. And then in the end, kind of the, the write, written by credit is someone who owns that that first draft usually. Okay. And so for us, we would own the ones where like, oh, we just had the, the clearest vision on what we wanted to lay out. And then the team would help us rewrite it and fix it. But in terms of um, the two episodes that weren't written by us, you know, Devin and Ian were, you know, just ha- held a clearer vision on those episodes and on those, those characters. And they were the right ones to help us um, take it home and, and uh, we, you know, we yeah. love we love their episodes. That's yeah. awesome. Is is this the first project um, delivered by Wonderstorm? Yes. Yeah. This is the first. Yeah. Hopefully, yeah. the first of many, many projects. But yeah. Yes. This is the first one. Yeah. That's awesome. And did you guys work on any other projects to help out? Any other properties or anything like that? Or did you form no, the company we, um, to build this? Yeah. When we we started out, when we started the company, we started talking about what we were going to do, and then we just all in on on Zadia and the Dragon Prince. That became sort of the the primary thing we were working on. And then we you know we were working on the show and then trying to yeah. get the game off the ground at the same time. Yeah. Um, do we have a second project? No, not yet. Okay. I was just <laughs> we do we do we do have another thing percolating. Yeah, we're exactly. we're starting to talk about it. Yeah. And we're pretty I'm pretty excited about it. Yeah. But we haven't we haven't found a partner yeah. yet to bring it to help us bring it to life and stuff like that. Yeah, so we're, we're working on that. We're getting ready. Okay. But, Okay. Yeah, well, there cool are um, cool project, yeah. there are nine episodes in the first season, and at New York Comic Con, you guys announced a second season. So, congratulations on the launch, and, Thank congr- you. and congratulations on more. Is it going <laughs> to be a um, a regular sort of uh, suite of nine episodes? Is that kind of what you guys are thinking? Nine, ten, or that's yes, that's what we're thinking. Okay. Um, it for us, we used to we think of that quantity. It's about nine times 22 minutes. It ends up being about three and a half, three, yeah, three and a half hours, hours or so. Yeah. Yep. So we, we think of that as a, a Lord of the Rings worth of content <laughs> cool. per season. So mm-hmm. yeah. a very epic chunk of story per season is what we, what we want to bring out and tell. And, um, you know, hopefully we get to do this a number of times. You know, we have uh, a pretty long plan in mind for a number of seasons. So, um, you know, knock on wood, like... The audience seems to love it and yeah. be forming a strong community around this, and we have a big story to tell. And how how is your relationship with Riot now? Since most of you are from there or, or veterans from Riot, are are, are we going to see Dragon Prince characters and content in uh, in <laughs> League of Legends? Is that something that we we can reveal today? <laughs> no, 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 probably not. I, I think yeah. Riot thinks of their audience as older so some of our audience can be younger yep um you know our relationship is like we have i mean we were were talking to friends at riot today we you know there are tons of amazing talented people who we worked with who we're rooting for who are supporting us and we're trying to support them but i don't think there's any there's no direct collaboration 
being planned. Very cool. You guys, yeah, uh, watch it. Give yeah, us a call. Give us a call. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We'll we'll tweet that out to make sure that they see this. <laughs> yeah, Rito, please. Is uh, is all the voice recording being done in uh, in Canada? I noticed Omari Newton is one of the uh, the cooler characters. Yeah. Yes. yes, yeah, that's right. We're, yeah. um, we record we recorded all the episodes for the first season um, in Vancouver um, cool. at Vita Spark mm-hmm. um, and Cosmic Sound and. Um, we did all of our casting up there. Obviously, Jack DeSena is from from here, but all the casting was done through Canada. Yep. Um, our partner, um, our amazing partner, Bardell, uh, is in Vancouver, and yep. we're up there. The animation studio. The animation studio, yeah. sorry. Yeah, we're up there, I don't know, like once a month at least. Um, John Carlo, who's our one of our executive producers. and, and going uh, up this he, week? He's going up tomorrow. Fantastic. So, yeah. So when so you, you guys, can mob him at the at the airport. Well, that means that when you guys are ready to start talking about season two, now that I'm a I'm a fan and I'll be waving the flag for the Dragon Prince. But uh, yeah. uh, when you guys are up in Vancouver, that's where we're based. So we'll have to get together yeah. in, in in IRL, as the kids say. Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> yeah. That sound sounds cool. Great. Um, yeah. And uh, you know, I'm 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 curious about the. Um, Cosplay has that started to happen already? Because when you yes. design these characters, <laughs> that, I, um, I, I think yeah, about mind, that. It's mind blowing. It's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, how quickly people like pull off these amazing costumes and like these. It's it's incredible. Near Comic Con, there were a bunch. I'm not going to say one. My favorite one was actually. I'm not going to spoil anything. But my favorite one was something spoil? I don't want to spoil. No, no, because he hasn't seen it. Yeah. Um, oh. And so. Oh. Uh, yeah. I know what you're about. <laughs> yeah. But there's been a, just absolutely incredible. Yeah. There were out there. Callums and there was Renan and Rayla. And, Bate and Rayla. Yeah. The what Bate does that feel like? Incredible. I mean, you yeah. guys have got you've seen your Nathan Drakes and you've seen yes. you know League of Legends characters and things like that and Avatar stuff. But this is your wholly own. And, you know, started from the ground up baby and you yeah. did the deal yourselves with Netflix. And what does it feel like to see people dressed as your characters? It's 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 it makes me cry a little bit, honestly. Like the first yeah. time the first one I saw, I was like, OK, I'm tearing up like I got hold it together. <laughs> yeah, no, it's incredible. It's it's amazing that people love the show as much as I think we do and want to be part of it to the point where they're dressing yeah. up like it. Right. I mean, it's. I wish I had a better body, or I'd dress up like you know Soren or something. You know, I need to, I need to lose a little weight so I can, uh, I can dress up. You've got a creator's body, Justin. <laughs> you are creating things. Oh you God. are building it's things. Good. Yeah. It's pretty good. That's exactly right. Exactly right. Well, speaking uh, of no, crea- it's super rewarding. Well, speaking of creating things, though, are you guys creating the video game? You're from video yes. games. So yes. Have, What's going um, on there? We've got a full team here uh, of amazing people from Naughty Dog and Riot and Microsoft and all these different places, Blizzard, um, different places who have come together. We we were really lucky. Um, so on the show side, we had a partner um, with Netflix, obviously, and they believed in the show and they they bought it and, and gave us money to make it. And then we found on the game side, uh, our initial investor is MWM, um, mm-hmm. or they used to be called Madison Wells Media. It was founded by Clint Kisker and Gigi Pritzker. Um, Clint was in was at Legendary. Yeah. Um, Gigi has owned Odd Lot Films for a number of years or created well, Odd so Lot So part Films. of it is they're not just game partners. Yeah, they, they got the idea that we wanted to do something that would be an experience in storytelling, but also game experiences, yeah. other things. They have a pretty broad media vision, right? Their approach is they have a VR company and a live events company and a yeah. movie company. And um, so they definitely have a big media vision. And that's part of why they were... They came in to support us and help us kind of grow Wonderstorm's vision from being startup sized yeah. to hopefully being something where we can make things that reach a big audience with awesome stuff. Yeah. That's and so amazing. they helped us get it off the ground. And so now we got this team working full tilt, um, trying to get this thing out. How, how does that come together? Does that come together before you guys go and talk to Netflix? Or is that you get a Netflix uh, letter of intent and then you go and you get the big investment? <laughs> what we, what we, when we looked up how to do this on the internet, <laughs> it was a little unclear. Um, well, it's interesting because actually the, the answer is... It's all at the same time, isn't a, it? A, a lot of... When we went to people who invest in traditional entertainment enterprises, and traditional meaning TV shows or movies, they were like, oh yeah, this seems cool, but video games are scary to us. We know they make a lot of money, but uh, we don't know when they win and when they lose. Yeah. yeah. And when we talked to... Uh, people who came at it from the gaming side, they were like, cool, you guys have a team of amazing devs and like, you like what a pedigree, this is awesome, but whoa, TV shows? That seems like <laughs> so uh, scary. when content wins or loses. Yeah. So on both sides, people were scared about the other side. They were kind of like, in theory, we'd hear words like the Holy Grail and stuff like that. 
but everyone was afraid of the other side. And so that, that was the great thing about MWM was yeah. they were like, this is ambitious on both sides and we love that. So, um, so the answer is you talk to a lot of people yeah. who say you guys are amazing and we love what you're doing and we would no way we're putting anything into it, <laughs> but awesome. Yeah. And they're like, we're so excited for you yeah. and keep in touch. Yeah. And that happened so many times. Yeah. So, but then ultimately we had kind of uh, MWM and that partnership was happening at the same time as the show was starting to get traction um, in entertainment. And so the show found a partner in, in Netflix that said like, we, we get it. We, we love it. We, we want to support your vision as creators and help you yeah. help you build this show. Yeah. Well, Nef so, Netflix, we own it. We own so yeah, was, that was my next question. Like, had to license it back to ourselves or anything like that. Like we just owned it outright. So that enabled us to go talk to people like MWM and whatever and say, we want to make a game too. Cause the, you know, that, that was part of our vision. That was my next question about, uh, but you've got a partnership now with Netflix and Netflix. It's obviously they're, they're going to have a lot more competition in the streaming space very soon. So, um, are they a partner for life kind of with this, with this project? Are they, <laughs> I don't but, know. Yeah. Netflix, are you watching? Are you, are you, are you, give us a call. <laughs> right? I feel yeah. like I'm thinking of the, uh, what's that straight up the Paul, Paul Abdul yeah, song. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, no, we've loved working with Netflix. So for sure, if we have another chance to work with them and do another show with them, yeah. um, we would love to do that. And, uh, but nice. we just have to take it one yeah. day at a time. I mean, it may be that hopefully they, they love our second project and, and maybe we do that, and, yeah. but we'll we'll see. Yeah. You never know. That's awesome. When are we going to hear more about season two? And when are we going to hear more about the next thing that Wonderstorm is working on? Season two, um, end of this year, we'll, we'll probably start. I mean, from here on out, we'll start talking a little bit more about it. So, like, we are we just announced it last week. So, as we go so forward, yeah. We're, we're just starting to understand the timing on, yeah. on when the production would be finished and when, you know, Netflix would launch it, et cetera. So, it'll yeah. be... 2019, yes, almost 2019. for a certain. Yeah, That's, exactly. Um, but uh, we're we're working hard. We had um, we had a lot of ideas, so we've had a head start. So we're we've already got a lot of progress, um, and um, yeah, as we, we'll hopefully be announcing more soon. soon. Yeah, and then as far as the next thing, like I don't know, God willing, soon. <laughs> <laughs> kind of know what we want to do. We have a pitch. We, we yeah, we're literally yeah. on the cusp of like we're we're deciding: are we ready to take this out or yeah. not? And it's like we're talking about like next week. Yeah, and we're, but we're I'm excited about it. Yeah, and like we have all this amazing concept art because a lot of our team from the Dragon Prince has helped us develop this next project, and so yeah, we're um we're gonna be taking that to Netflix and other potential partners like in the next couple weeks soon yeah, yeah exactly so hopefully well, soon wonderful how big is wonderstorm how many people do you have working with you right now we have 20 people um in the office 20 so people in la in la and then yeah. the dragon prince team is about 200 people yeah, in, in vancouver, in vancouver. so incredible. Yeah. incredible well congratulations again you guys thank you so much thank for so being much. on the show and i can't wait to uh to connect with you and and do uh, an in-person interview i think it'll be really fun and let's yeah, try to absolutely. do that in vancouver we'll, we'll definitely do that that sounds great cool and you guys should be watching the dragon prince it is absolutely wonderful these guys are very good at their jobs all right right now we're going to move on to a buried treasure I'm sure I've talked about this one before, but hell, it's still a buried treasure. It's called Weapon Lord. It's for the Super Nintendo and the Genesis. I have the Super Nintendo version of this game. Now, obviously, this is a very dated game. It came out in 1995. It's not state-of-the-art by any means, but it was ahead of its time uh, for, you know, a couple of reasons. It was a weapons-based fighter, so big swords and all kinds of battle axes and maces and just gory awful things to impale each other with were a part of the mechanics of the gameplay and it was fun to hack and slash and you know chop at your uh, your opponents thought that was all super cool but it was also super cool that it was uh, kind of Conan the Barbarian esque you know like these giant barbarian characters with huge hulking muscles and uh, you know amazing skills and it was just fun to create so much carnage with these terrific character designs in these different arenas that we get to fight in with this game one of the w things that makes this the game so special though, is James Goddard worked on this title he created this game and he had come from Capcom and their school of design actually had invented the uh, character of DJ and had understood the fundamentals of fighting through the the 
prism of the Street Fighter franchise, which is some pretty good training to go off and build your own fighting game. So there's a there's a polish and a pedigree that is instantly recognizable when you uh, boot up Weapon Lord. Uh, you know, a modernized Weapon Lord for 2018 or 2019 would be a hell of a lot of fun. Just the idea of barbarians fighting each other, or this sort of fantasy-fueled, Frank Fazetta-style influenced combat with characters like this would be really fun. And I feel like some developer out there should pick up the battle axe and do something like this again. And that's why I'm gonna keep saying that you should definitely hunt this one down. And Weapon Lord is absolutely a terrific buried treasure. Ah, uh, Weapon Lord, very, very fun game, and man, that takes me back. It's good to see you, Blair Farrell and Sam I M one 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 and uh, Warco A, Jordan Cunningham, Metric Gaming, the VR Grid. Fantastic to have everybody here. Adrian Leon, I think, is in the house. Tyler Fisher, you guys are wonderful, and and thank you for joining us on this Monday. It's beautiful in Vancouver. I don't know what it's like uh, where you are, but we don't normally have October's that are so sunny and gorgeous and crunchy because of all those uh, leaves on the ground and all the colors up in the trees, crazy. Uh, the other thing that's happening obviously in October is that all the games are coming out and one that has come out, um, actually comes out tomorrow, uh, but I got my code on Friday. We did an unboxing and I think we were, actually I think the video is still set to private. Somebody reached out to me and said uh, we were too soon on revealing the toys for some reason. Um, so I, but I had no idea. So it was an honest mistake. Everybody forgave me. Um, but Starlink Battle for Atlas uh, is here. It's upon us, and the uh, the toys are hitting the shelves. And uh, you can jump into this toys to life game made by Ubisoft, and it is a big um, space shooter experience. But more than that, it is a massive role playing experience, and it's also a Star Fox game if you play it on the Nintendo 64. And I will say, I've got it on the PlayStation 4 and I'm gonna show you the game a little bit later on the PlayStation 4 so you can see some of the visuals and some of the storytelling in that. Um, but there is no way in hell I would play this game on any other platform than the Nintendo Switch if I had a choice. Uh, now clearly if you don't have a choice uh, and you don't wanna plunk down the dough for the Nintendo Switch, uh, right now, that's that's fine. You're still going to have a good time with Starlink. Uh, but Starlink with Star Fox and Slippy the Toad. Slippy the Toad! Freaked out Slippy the Toad with his amphibian fingers, who is also a hacker in this game. He's crazy. He's always in trouble. I love that guy. And Falco, and and they're all chasing after Star Wolf. They, they kind of wedged that whole Star Fox story into the game uh, elegantly. But you can tell it's just like, it's like they tetris it into the experience. And I was curious to see, when I played it for about an hour on the PlayStation 4, just to see the uh, opening sequence and the storytelling and the, the chatter. I actually like the characters that um, Ubisoft put together for Starlink Battle for Atlas. They're actually really cool. They, they feel like, speaking of animated series, like we were just talking about um, uh, the Dragon Prince, it does feel like they've got characters that they could anchor to a show, uh, but they clearly have built these characters with the idea that you're going to collect them all. You know, you're going to collect the toys, and you can collect the little action figures. They pop into the ships. They're not really, they don't, they're not action figures, but they're little, uh, almost like little miniatures of the characters, and each one of them can pop into the ships. Um, I, I dig them. But the game is vastly improved when you introduce, you know, a lot of the Nintendo nostalgia kind of juggernaut of putting in Star Fox in there and do do a barrel roll. You get a little bit of that action in the gameplay and you can reverse the ship really quickly. And it's just amazing to have the R-Wing. And I didn't bring the R-Wing to the studio today because the R-Wing is attached to my, my Switch. I'm still playing Starlink Battle for Atlas. It is a very, very big game, and it's actually a lot more complicated and complex than you would initially give it credit uh, for or to. It's not just a, um, it's not just a space shooter. It's not just a, an avenue to sell toys. Ubisoft is smarter than that. Uh, first off, you can buy the digital versions of the game, not buy any of the toys, and still have a very fun time. It's an RPG, and you're leveling up a lot of things. You're leveling up your pilot. You're leveling up your uh, weaponry. You're leveling up your ship. And there's a lot of collectibles out there. You're collecting the currency of the world. I think it's called Ethereum or Illyrium or something like that. Um, you're in the pursuit of uh, creating energy um, to power big, vast spaceships. Uh, there's this evil force called the Legion, uh, headed up by a character I think named Grax. There's a lot of names. Um, and you sort of join the side of the resistance against these characters. There's there's huge global conflicts on and on several of the planets that you're going to go to in the Atlas system. It's like a solar system. It's a star system. 
Uh, and so you can travel from world to world and you collect the money and you collect the modifications for your weaponry and you go and free and rescue, um, you know, different people that might be researching a, a base station or you might go to a uh, refinery or something like that or um, fix a, a modding station um, and you're trading in the currencies, you're picking up... Um, well, you're scanning details about some of the animals and things like that that might be cruising around. It almost looks a little bit like No Man's Sky, kind of dumbed down version of No Man's Sky. Uh, and you're also picking up some of the uh, natural sort of resources that might exist on the planet, plant life or uh, mining or something like that. You take some of those materials to some of these stations. You trade them in either for currency or for upgrades or modifications that will make your weapons better, your ship better. Uh, and then you're unlocking um, different attributes and, and skills and things that you will uh, then buy, purchase through your big mothership called the Elysia. There's a lot of names. I can't remember. And part of the, uh, the all the names part of it, because the core of the game is you're running around on Earth, um, always in a ship. And that's an issue, but you're always in a ship, and on Earth it's kind of more ground-based. You can fly up and do some uh, hovering above the planet and get into some sort of aerial dogfight stuff, but normally you're sort of on the planet, uh, almost tank-like, like hover tank-like, zipping around and taking out all the bad guys and stuff, or you're out in space. Um, most of the time in space, it's spent traveling and avoiding um, traps that are being set, sent out to get you from outlaws. Um, and you're in hyperspace trying to get from planet to planet. So you're spending a lot of time traveling or wiping out the outlaws that will invariably stop you along the way. And sometimes you get into these situations where you've got a long distance to go and hyperspace is just taking forever. You can see those numbers, you know, dropping down, but then all of a sudden the outlaws will come and uh, get you and you'll have to start that whole thing again uh, if you want to keep with your ship. Now, what you can do is you can substitute these ships in anytime that you want to. If you've got a, a bunch of them physically sitting around you or if you've got the digital version of the game, uh, you can play it digitally that way. On the Switch, you can... Um, uh, once the game is unlocked stuff, if you've got the physical version, it, it's a complicated game, I'm telling you. But once you've unlocked stuff with the physical um, goods that you have, they are also digitally unlocked if you undock the Switch and leave and play uh, off, off of the mobile, you know, portably. And it's very effective. It's very cool. Um, so you can access all of the different pilots and ships and things like that that you want to. Um, so you don't have to bring the toys with you. It's really fun to be surrounded by the toys, but as you can tell, the toys are not small. You know, the characters are pretty small, but the ships are pretty big. And I had all of these things all around my little gaming chair, my little, you know, my chair and my nook, and I, I felt a little hemmed in by spaceships, which was cool, but it was just like I couldn't, like, reach for my coffee or anything like that without knocking over a spaceship, you know? My little figures were flying all over the place. And also, switching the... Um, uh, switching the weapons, it, it, it's pretty quick and they're pretty robust. They're meant to be, you know, uh, inter, you know, uh, mingled by smaller fingers and smaller hands. You can just yank them off like that. I don't know. It's like a USB connections or something like that. But um, it it does take a little bit of time because some of them, like these, are in a little bit tighter on the bottom, and I was worried I was going to bust some of these things. But they're pretty durable. Uh, but there's a couple of different ways that you can do this switcheroo on each of these uh, each of these vehicles and the and the pilots and things like that. You can do it in real time, which is which gets really hairy because you'll be in a battle and all of a sudden you're like, oh my god, I gotta get a new weapon on there to take out this thing and this like and so don't do that. Um, you want to pause it, but then of course it sort of stops everything and you're in the menu system, and the menu system is really like overwhelming when you first jump into this game. It's like, I, get, I update this, I upload that, I get this, I get that, I unlock this, I gotta save this guy, I gotta go over here, gotta do this. It was like, wow, this is a deep, deep experience. And all of it is pretty damn cool, but it's a, it's a lot, it's a lot. And also the fact that the ships, they're, they're 40 bucks each in, can, uh, in Canada. I just looked it up on Amazon. So a ship like this with a pilot is 40 bucks. And it comes with weapons. Uh, you can get weapon packs, which are about 15 bucks. You can get pilot packs. And there's lots of, uh, you know, other characters that they're introducing into this thing. Uh, and they're about 12 or 13 bucks each. Um, the Star Fox starter pack with the game and everything like that, with the ship, with the R-Wing and, and Star Fox, I think is around 100 bucks Canadian. 
you'll be into this if you collect all of the ships. You'll be into this for a few hundred bucks. And, you know, that's something definitely to consider. You, I think you really got to love the designs of the ships. I do. I think they're pretty damn impressive and cool. And frankly, it's, it's shocking that uh, the No Man's Sky folks didn't think of something like this with their game because they thought of everything else. And I know that there was a collector's edition that took forever for No Man's Sky to get just one ship out to people. And it's impressive as hell that Ubisoft has never done Toys for Life or Toys to Life before. And they've come up with uh, robustly designed and uh, sleek looking, you know, interchangeable aircraft like this or spacecraft like this. It's pretty damn cool, but you I think you got to really be invested in this. And one of the challenges is that it's all brand new. And it, 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 I think right from the get-go, I, the thing that I appreciated about Starlink, and I still have a lot more to mine. There's a lot of, like there's a core sort of story mode that you're going to dive into, but there's also lots of extra missions that you're going to go off uh, on. But I felt like it's it's just a lot. It's a lot to, to, to bite off as one big, you know, fell swoop. All of the other, like Skylanders kind of built up to it, built up to their thing. Disney kind of leaned on all of the licenses that they had. Lego had tons of licenses and some familiarity with, with the game designs. This is like all brand new. We haven't had, uh, you know, cool Star Fox type experiences in a long time. We haven't had good accessible space shooters really in abundance. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of, unfamiliarity, I think, for a people to kind of jump into with this. I don't think that this is just purely a kid's game. I think that this is a game for people like me that have been in the, you know, been following this business for a long time and have really fun memories of games like Star Fox and X-Wing versus TIE Fighter, uh, really dug No Man's Sky. Um, it's all much more simplified than the most robust simulations out there, but it's a lot deeper and there's a lot more detail than you would imagine this to be. It's not just like a Star Fox ride the rails type thing at all. You know, there's elements of that gameplay if you play the Star Fox version of the game. Uh, but for the most part, it's really like a, uh, you know, a, a refined and accessible I, No Man's Sky slash Mass Effect type fusion of an RPG, which is cool. So I applaud the hell out of Ubisoft doing this. I am still very curious to see how it's going to fare in the marketplace because it's very, it's very much, you know, out of nowhere in a way. I mean, surprised that it surprised us like crazy at E3 when they released it last year. Huge surprise when the Star Fox news came out this year, um, and I I think they've succeeded, and I like it. And I guess that's all I can really comment on is that I, I, li I like this game. I like playing it. I do wish I could hop out of the ships. I do wish that I got to know these characters a little bit more um, in gameplay, not just in the cool cutscenes, because the cutscenes are, are pretty sweet, and I like all the heads-up display stuff where the characters pop up in there, funny lines, uh, you know, lots and lots and lots of detail. But I, it's almost like I wish they had created, like with the Dragon Prince, a little bit of an animated series or something, uh, even just a, a short one, like a six-episode run to kind of get us familiar with this world and then brought out all of this stuff. But you know what? At the core of it, they sent it to me. I got a chance to dive into the gameplay. I've been happy. I am uh, very impressed by the... And I shouldn't be surprised because Ubisoft is a very good game development company. They make really cool things, and this does. It uses the Snowdrop engine. You can fly from the uh, planets out into the atmosphere, you know, in a, in a wonderful, you know, fount of animation. It's gorgeous, and, and zipping through asteroids is super fun. I showed all of this stuff to my daughter, uh, who's six, and she dug it all as well. She, when I showed her that the wings come off and the characters pop out, she was like, oh, my God, that's cool. But, you know, I, I still feel like more info or more education around all of this stuff, I think was probably prudent and probably a little bit more needed for the average consumer out there. So I'm going to give this, because I think it did succeed, even though it is a pricey thing. Uh, I'm going to give this an eight out of 10 because there's a lot of cool gameplay in here, but I really want to know what you guys think. And if you are going to be jumping on board the Starlink Battle for Atlas uh, wagon and what version you're going to get and uh, truthfully, I, I don't know. I mean, it, it's fun in every version, but that Star Fox extra just makes it so much more compelling, for me at least.
All right, so eight from me, but I want to hear from you. Let's move on. I've got a review of A Quiet Place now. John Krasinski and Emily Blunt are everywhere these days, and a big reason why they're going to be everywhere for a long time to come is the success of A Quiet Place, which is a horror movie that came out earlier this year. It's hitting home video formats, and I finally got a chance to check this thing out, uh, and everybody kept telling me to see this thing in the theater. I never did. I never got to it. I've been traveling. You guys know I've been crazy busy, but Krasinski and uh, Blunt, who are married, put this thing together. Uh, John Krasinski actually directs this thing. He stars in it with his wife, and uh, they put together a riveting thriller. It is absolutely fantastic, this movie. It evoked a lot of similar vibes that I got from uh, Steven Spielberg's terrific War of the Worlds, where you've got an alien presence, some kind of being that is terrorizing everybody that's left on Earth, and you only get little scraps and pieces of paper, so in that way it kind of evoked a little bit of what uh, M. Night uh, Shyamalan did with Signs, where he kind of contained everything to this family. And it's very much what's uh, at stake here. We've got this family that uh, John Krasinski and Emily Blunt are the uh, the father and mother of, and they're trying to keep their kids alive because what's happened is these creatures that are wiping out humanity, they can't see, they're blind, but they have extrasensory hearing powers. And if they hear anything out of the ordinary, they come racing and slicing and dicing and, and they killed people really quickly and, and mercilessly. And we see a little bit of that and it affects the family in some horrific ways. For the most part, you're just on the edge of your seat wondering, is anybody going to drop a hammer? Is anybody going to, you, you know, crinkle a piece of paper? I, you know, don't slam that toilet seat too hard. You're just worried that any kind of sound that the characters are making in this movie is going to be the end of them. And it's so effectively crafted for you, so well presented. It's a gorgeous looking movie as well. I mean, they they, they shot it all kind of in rural areas and, and uh, a great little farmhouse. And, you know, so we've got cornfields and forests and the sun dappling the trees and everybody looks great in the sunlight except that they're sweating and terrified and their hair's all matted and they're freaking out that they're going to make any kind of a sound and the creature effects are pretty magnificent in here as well they went with the kind of jaws don't show them too much kind of ethos which i think was a smart play so a lot of it is left to your imagination and you're just terrified for everybody the kids are in harm's way which kind of brought back some memories of uh, the the original Jurassic Park when the kids looked like they were going to get chomped by a T-Rex. There's lots of moments like that, which is incredibly effective. So I think, yeah, a major tip of the hat to what Steven Spielberg has done with his films is particularly his scarier movies. But God, this is deftly handled. Not too big of a bite, no pun intended, in terms of uh, scope and scale. And I think that was the smart play here. Confine your world. Keep it something manageable. Keep it tense and nail-biting all the way through it and you're going to keep people hooked and that's exactly what happened. I saw this on a plane so I didn't see it in the best place imaginable but I had uh, my earbuds in and I was on the edge of my seat and I jumped a few times and I think the Honestly, it didn't hurt the movie at all to see it in a, in a screen where I was like really having to concentrate and focus. I didn't take my, my eyes off the screen for a second through this thing too. I was in there and I believe the characters, the kids are fantastic actors as well. The script is lean and tight and efficient and pretty damn impressive. And that's the way I come away from A Quiet Place in general. What an impressive picture. This is the uh, directorial debut of John Krasinski. This is, uh, you know, a husband and wife powerhouse couple making something powerful and meaningful. And it, it sounds like there's more on the way. It sounds like the, this made such good money at the box office that uh, studios are going to be uh, giving these guys more work. But also we'll probably see a sequel to A Quiet Place as well. And I recommend that if you have not seen this thing, Turn up the speakers in your home theater and uh, sit down, turn off all the lights, get some popcorn, but munch that popcorn quietly because you're going to want to pay attention and listen to every damn thing in this terrific movie. I'm going to give A Quiet Place a 9 out of 10. I saw some uh, meh 
type responses to A Quiet Place. For me, it it shook me, man. I thought it was incredible uh, and some really powerful performances. But anyways, it is time to move on. It is kind of Starlink Day today here on uh, on EP Live. I wanted to play the game. Now, I th we showed a lot of footage from the Star Fox version of the game, which is the superior version of the title for sure, um, even if the graphics are better on the PlayStation 4 and Xbox One. But I wanted to show you a little bit of the uh, PlayStation 4 game in uh, motion. And before I do, Faramir would it says, would it be wiser to buy Star Starlink digitally so that one doesn't have to manage so many toys. Um, th I think that all depends on your predilection. I think if you like the toys, you're going to have a lot of fun, uh, you know, mixing and matching the, the, the different weapons and tr trying out the different wing com configurations in physical form. Uh, but you can also do that digitally. You can do all of that mix and match stuff, and I'll show you uh, digitally because I did not get the... I just, whoops, I just got the, uh, I just got the game. I just got a code for the game. I did not get the attachment so I could stick the, uh, um, the uh, system or the ships onto the controller like I did with the Nintendo version. Um, so let's give it a shot. Blake's going to come out here and join us. And this is Let's Play and Chat with Starlink, a battle for Atlas. So feel free to ask us any questions or throw up any comments, anything that you want. Don't throw up in real life. Just throw comments at us. And let's play a little Starlink. Okay, we're going to try a new game. Here we go. We'll try normal difficulty. Um, we'll brighten it up just a little bit for you guys. We'll put it right about there. Does that look okay? Yeah, that looks good. Okay, here we go. Let us know how it sounds, how it looks. It is not in VR, VR grid. Sorry, buddy. It does seem like a suitable candidate for some VR. It'd be fun to do a segment on changing the toys while you've got the VR headset on. That would. That's probably why it's not on VR. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Because Ubisoft is all about VR, aren't they, right? Yeah, they have a lot of VR that's stuff. That's probably why they didn't I, do it. I just want to see somebody fumbling around with their <laughs> VR set, trying to <laughs> mix and match and to see what kinds Whoa. of toys that uh, they, they hobble together. <laughs> They're slapping on Skylanders onto their spaceships and stuff. You could, put, you could put the ship on the VR headset. Yeah. So you have it like on your, on your head. Yeah. And then you're like flying it by moving your head. I'm gonna play as Judge, who I think is pretty cool. I like I like uh, uh, Mason. He's got kind of cool hair. I like that. Um, and this guy's a little bit annoying, but he's also got some funny stuff. This is Eli or Levi. He's pretty cool. Uh, Shade is my daughter's favorite. She's badass, and I don't know if my daughter's into knives or something. But, but <laughs> I like this. What is this creature here? This green dude. This is a character that you meet later on. He's but, cool. They give you him digitally unlocked right away. So you meet some of these characters along the way. That and then you cool get him. too. This one is kind of like um, one of the... Flower like, he's like an odd world character, isn't he? Yeah. From the odd world that happens. So I'm going to be the robot. I like robots. So here we go. We go into this. I turned the music down, so we might not get any... Oh, that might have been a mistake. Uh, thanks for the super chat, oh, okay, Metric here Gaming. We go. Here we go. Judge. Okay, so now you can choose any of the five ships. Of course, there is no R-Wing in the PlayStation 4 version of the game. What? Yeah, so... Unacceptable. Yeah. I like... What, what's I don't Sony have character? this one. I don't have that one. I have I have these three and the R-Wing, so I don't have this one or that one. I'm going to choose this one. What Here Sony character could they have had as the exclusive in place of Star Jack Fox? and Daxter. Or Ratchet yeah. and Clank. Yeah. Got, have Kratos flying around in a ship. Well, Ra uh, Ratchet and Clank would have been amazing. And okay. on the Xbox uh, version, what would that be? Halo? Probably Halo, right? Yeah. That'd be pretty cool. Or, yeah, it would have been Halo. Or Gears. No, Gears doesn't really have spaceships. Okay, so you have different types of weapons. I didn't go into... I, my review was getting le lengthy. It was all done in real time, as you know. But uh, I didn't go into all of the different weapon types and stuff that you have. You have fire weapons and, and stasis weapons and uh, freeze rays. and So I've got a, I've got a freeze weapon right now, and I'm going to put a flamethrower, because this is kind of a good way to start. Seems really you, complicated. Already, right? Like, this is the first thing. Like, I can already mod my I'm, weapons. I'm overwhelmed just watching. Yeah, I can mod my weapons right now, but I don't have any mods, so I got to go out and get those. Okay, so here so we go. So you're doing this digitally, but if you had the toys, you could do this with toys? Yeah, it'll... You mod, like, the weapons? You no, just... you don't mod the weapons di in physical form. You do oh. it in the game. So you're yeah, still but in but the menu a lot. I saw that in the lot. commercial, the little kids taking out the, the weapons and stuff. Well, you right? can change the weapons, but you can't mod the weapons. You, you basically improve but, the weapons. But when I take a weapon out and put a new weapon in, it registers that in the game, Yes, right? it does. It has... That weapon has been improved. Okay. So wherever, whatever ship you put it on, okay. the physical version of that, it will work 
at okay, that skill okay. level. It's just like the Skylanders kind of deal. So oh, I yeah, and these are your little USB things that attach them together. Okay, so this is the, the, the big ship. I called it the Elysium or something. I can't remember what it is. I, the I Enterprise. I turned the music down. Okay, so I got I got I do have voiceover. Uh, someone is asking, yeah, VR Grid. Only the Switch version has an exclusive character. Yeah. Is that a Beyond Good and Evil shirt he's wearing? Could be. Is that that's, is that the monkey? That from, is the uh, monkey. Yeah, I think you're right. I swear to God, I, I I'm standing by my yeah. conspiracy that this they made this with the same technology that they're making Beyond Good and Evil Two with. Well, they probably said, "Look, we can we can get into the space stuff." I mean, this yeah, because looking at it, how you fly into the planet and then fly out, like that's like that no man's sky. Sure, sure. That's that's what Beyond Good and Evil Two is. Well, and I'm sure that they're thinking, you know, from the business standpoint of getting younger people into some space exploration in yeah. one of their future. And then in two big, or three years, when Beyond yeah, Good and Evil Two, yeah, comes yeah right. Out. I'm sure. They're not dumb over there. Ubisoft knows how to get the most out of their buck. You know, yeah, they're smart. Uh, Faramir has a question. If I buy a ship, can I use it on the Switch and the PS4? Yes. So these are... These Except are, the R-Wing, I, and because I don't have the you thing... You need an adapter, right? Yeah, I don't have the adapter, so I couldn't even try the R-Wing. I, I was curious what so would the, happen. So the adapters are specific to a console. Yes. But the ships aren't. Yeah, exactly. Okay. It's the same kind of stuff that um, <clears throat> Disney Infinity... Because there were exclusive stuff with Disney and Skylanders. Remember they had the uh, Donkey Kong characters yeah. in Skylanders? Yeah, they had Ami Skylanders Amiibo. Yeah, you couldn't, you couldn't use those anywhere else other than yeah, on. but they were the still Wii U. Skylanders branded Amiibo. Yeah, yeah. He's not gonna make it. Uh, Taz, no, I'm not gonna be in Ontario with Vic when Red Dead comes out. So maybe I'll play your copy when you get it. Yeah, <laughs> sure, that'll happen. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not as excited for Red Dead as everyone else is. Really? I'm not a big cowboy guy. I'm wow. Just, Okay. If it were Grand Theft Auto, I'd be excited. But right. I mean, I'm still going to play it. I'm just not, I, like, the, dying to play the, it. The thing about Red Dead is because we all played the first one and were blown away by it, and I, I imagine you were too, right? You were yeah. impressed by it. But we we know what that experience is going to feel like Yeah. to a degree, right? They can't sh shock us with... It can't turn suddenly turn into Assassin's Creed, you know? Like, it's, uh. it, it is... The Rockstar does a pretty good job of shaking things up. Oh, I, I know they will, but for the most part, we have this sort of built-in sort of appreciation of the, what the m mechanics and the story and, and the vibe of Red Dead Redemption 2 is going to yeah, be. But, I, but with Grand Theft, we're we have no surprised. idea where they're going to take us. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, because yeah. we might Grand be in a Auto takes spaceship today. In, yeah. in Grand Theft Auto. They, they have more, more to no. do, but I... I, I, I You'll be surprised when you play this game. Oh, yeah. They're I'm, definitely we'll, going to pull we'll, something out that you're not expecting. We'll be surprised and appreciative of the nuance in the game. But I think the overall meta feel of the title will be like, wow, we are in a vastly improved Wild yeah, West. Yeah. You know? That's, I think, the one challenge that they have. I'm, I'm going to skip this. Basically, what happens is the old guy gets taken because he's got some abilities, and then you got to try to figure out what's going on. Okay, so... So... We start off in space, and we're flying around. Shade, what's your status? Single. Uh, Jordan Cunningham, yeah, you can... Jordan Cunningham wants to know if you can mix and match between digital and physical ships. You can do that, right? Yeah. Like, if I buy some of the ships physically and the other ones digitally, I can still kind of use them. I, you know, I'm a little confused about <laughs> how... I don't, I don't quite know how much mixing and matching you can do, because I know that there's, like, a time limit... You unlock this stuff on, uh, tell, tell us if it's too loud. I think it might be too loud. I'm turning this down. I'll, uh, let me check. I got it. I got it. I just I turned it down. But I gotta check it relative. Okay. Well. Um, I think you can, um, you can, uh, I'll let Blake turn this down. I think you, I'm getting drowned out by laser fire. Okay, so, it's pretty cool, right? Yeah. Not a bad little opening. Does it sound okay? Okay, um, it's loud in my head, in my ear. Okay, uh, no, it's okay. I, I'll take it out of one. Um, I, there is definitely some mix and match on the Switch. There's like a time limit if you have the physical stuff and you unlock the the um, stuff physically. There's a time limit for how long it will operate digitally when you go into um, portable mode. It's kind of confusing, guys. I I'm not gonna lie, and and also like. 
They got the stuff to us last week, not two weeks ago. So I haven't had two weeks with everything. I've had, you know, a few days with everything. Um, and so I've got a good feel on the gameplay, but I don't, I don't have every single thing figured out with every permutation across every version of the game <laughs> right now. But they, I think if you dig the idea and dig the game they want and the characters... You to, they want parents to be confused so that they buy uh, more than they need to. No, I, th I think what it is is that there, it, it, it's a big ordeal to get physical objects on store shelves all at the same time everywhere and ship a game that works and you can mix and match all the stuff and take the things off of docks and things like like it's a it's a tremendous undertaking and like disney pulled out you know like and you'd think of any of the the companies disney would have stayed with it they had all these brands but didn't we i won't say his name but we were chatting with somebody who works at disney yeah at e3 a few years ago do you remember this and they were telling us how part of the reason why disney infinity was financially hey, unsuccessful is because Disney overestimated to and made to too longer. many toys. Yes. So if they but if they had managed it better it still would have been profitable. Well that's what I'm saying is like it's incredibly difficult and I think that Ubisoft did the best that they could on getting these these uh, packages to reviewers and to people to kind of break it down for people but I think there's going to be a lot of confusion about how you can you know interact with all of this stuff and play with all this stuff because it's here. Like, it's, a, it's out tomorrow, and people are probably combing through reviews and watching reviews and playthrough. The core of the game is very good, though. It's very solid with a cool story, and uh, yeah, I think this is Grax right here. He's taking the uh, Saint, Saint Grand, the, uh, the older guy, and he's blowing up the ship, and uh, bad things are going to happen. This is unique, though, in the Toys to Life, this ability to mix and match. Like, to take the thing apart yes, and play true. with it. Yes, true. That's new. Yes. And it would be cool if, there, like, the characters popped out and you could run around as a character. Or if there were other types of vehicles, like tanks and things like that on the ground. Or a little, you know, yeah. I, I think Ubisoft is banking on part of the profit, profitability of this being that kids will just want the no, toys. No, 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 no. You think of, like, Skylanders. And you said this about Disney Infinity. Because yeah. the toys for Disney Infinity were never that good. Well, you they, couldn't really they were play with them. Exceptional models, but they yeah, were but too you, small. And you and couldn't been, play with them. And they could this, have been great as actually. Like, I'm good. thinking, like, I'm, imag I'm putting myself in, like, my 10-year-old body. Yeah. Like, I would sit, I would sit and play with this sure. as a toy totally. if there was no game. Yeah. Okay. So Ubisoft is probably banking on parents and kids walking into the store seeing this and wanting Equinox, just this. Equinox, not Elysium. Elysium was the, uh, the movie. Uh, okay, so <laughs> we are going to... Uh, we la we crash landed on uh, this planet, and we're gonna flip the uh, spaceship around, and we're gonna go fly around and start getting into some missions here. I'm getting a Star Trek vibe from the design of some of these ships. It's cool. This this remind it's smaller, but it reminds me of a Vulcan cruiser. Oh, okay. Have that sort of circular thing at the end. Yeah, they've done a good job with the uh, with the ships. Because Ubisoft has made Star Trek games, so I'm. Oh, uh, okay. There's probably some well, cross-influence uh, there. I, I mean, they're all separate studios, right? Yeah, but that's all the Ubisoft family. I don't think they're all talking to each other like that. But know? don't they, don't, isn't Ubisoft known for doing, like, having, like, aggressors. different studios helping out on different things where their uh, strong suits are? Like, oh, we know this sure, studio but it, is good at... Sure, but in context of there being an influence from Star Trek, I would think that, that mm. that's just fans of Star Trek. Yeah. Not, not sure. necessarily okay, fine. a, a cross-studio... Conversation Star, about Star Trek influences the Equinox. Yeah. Okay, so the Equinox is is busted out, and I'm fighting bad guys right away. Some Legion bad guys. Legion. I feel like they're in every game. The Legion. So these guys, um, right a, right away in the game, they tell you that if you mix and match your weapons in some interesting ways, some en elemental ways, like I've got a fire and I've got an ice weapon, you can get some good um, combo effects and blow up characters in some interesting ways that way. I well, yeah, so need to know what time it is, because it's, uh, it's okay. what time, 2.10? Okay, we're going to play for um, 20 minutes. Cool. Okay. Uh, yeah, Jordan Cunningham was asking earlier about mixing and matching digital and physical ships. Yeah. The reason he was asking was because um, once the R-Wing toy, like the physical toy of the Star Fox R-Wing, yeah. but doesn't want to buy any of the other physical toys, you would have to be able to, to do that. I think so. I don't think they un they lock all of that stuff. I don't know, but I would guess you can't. But the, the weird thing is that I have the toys and I've unlocked the ships physically, 
in the Switch, and then I have the digital version of this, and all of the stuff is unlocked. So I feel like I've got everything unlocked, and I can, I can play with any, any f stuff I want. I don't know back. what it's like to just have one toy. I don't know what what kind of core game experience you're going to have. And I will tell you that I'm choosing to play um, all of the stuff on the Switch version as Star Fox. I, I'm playing it like I'm playing a Star Fox game. These toys are really cool. They are. Cool. I'm just looking at like this toy. Yeah. Like I I would sit and play with this as a kid. They like this succeeded. little skull thing on the back. This thing is cool. They succeeded for sure. Yeah. They did. I mean, cool. mission accomplished on this. The only, the only thing is, like, how do you get the story out so enough people? But you know what? Toys launch all the time that I've never heard of, and then they become massive success stories because the kids rally around that. And presumably, they've done a lot of focus testing on all this stuff with kids, and they know where they're going to go with that. If I had kids, I would buy this for them and then steal it from them. Play with it myself. Most parents do that kind of thing for sure. Yeah, they're definitely cooler than uh, they were going to get into ships and things. I think with Disney Infinity, they were gonna, they were going towards that, uh, but they're definitely cooler than the little Lego <coughs> ships that you get. Okay, so over to another Ubisoft property, Vic. Mm. Cody, Cody J has a burning question. Yes. Should I buy Assassin's Creed Odyssey now or wait for the price to drop? Oh man, it depends on what you're playing, how many things you've got on the go. It's an excellent game. If you didn't play Origins. And didn't beat everything with Origins. Might yeah, play that. Start that. there and then and then go Plat to this one. Platinum Origins. Yeah. The thing is though with Assassin's Creed, the problem is if you wait too long for the price to drop, the next Assassin's Creed game. Will be <laughs> well, the, the the good news is Odyssey's uh, got more content coming all throughout next year. Okay, so yeah, that's a good point because next year when they release expansions and stuff. They'll have like a collector's edition that you Try can buy the DNA game and the expansion for animal. like the, what the base price is right now. Yeah, next year for sure. That's something to consider. So complete. you can scan um, some of the creatures. Now none of this is randomly generated like No Man's Sky, right? No, it's all it's all orchestrated, and the and the um, creatures are endemic to the uh, planet that you're on. And so the uh, different kind of world. There's different kinds of worlds as well. Of course, ice planets and um, sort of swampy planets. And this is the uh, Tatooine-like planet. Yeah. I was just gonna. Yeah, this is Tatooine. They have Hoth and Dagobah. Yeah. These are cool looking. Oh, it's things. great. Cool yeah. Looking. And it does look much better on the PlayStation 4, by the way, than it does on the Switch. The Switch is not a slouch, but it it uh, it looks better. There's the surprise of the century. Yeah. And you've been playing this on the... Is this the Pro that we're playing this on right now? We're playing it on the Pro, yeah. Cool. Yeah. I don't know what kind... We're not patched through to any kind of HDR source or anything like that, but... Uh, um, I did take a look at it on my Pro at home and on my 4K TV, and I don't think it does HDR on the Pro, at least not yet. Do you think they will be... Oh, here's an interesting question from yep. Warco. Uh, I'm going to Montreal. Do any of the local Montreal studios, including Ubisoft, have a store for the public to visit? Ubisoft opened a, a, a place in Montreal. And it's open to the public? Yeah, yeah, uh, definitely. I think it's like Ubi, Ubisoft World or Ubi World or something oh, like that. that's right. Yeah. I remember talking about that, yeah. yeah. That's on the, that, where that amusement park is, right? Yeah. Now we require fuel. Can you help us? Sometimes you can reach out to the studios as well, and they'll uh, invite uh, invite you in for a tour or something like that. Yeah, Nintendo has a really cool store, but it's employees only. Like Nintendo in Seattle. Yeah, that store is awesome. Yeah. Are we allowed to talk about that store? Is that? Uh, I think everybody knows. Yeah. It's really cool. Yeah. So he's the first character you meet, and then you you can un in the digital version you unlock him and you got him. Okay, in the thicket. I will eliminate them. Okay, so I gotta go find my find his friend. Dude, so this is kind of your first mission now. It's an open world, and I'll show you. Uh, here's the star map. So it's a full, like almost like remember when Ratchet and Clank started doing this, and and Mario Odyssey and stuff. You can go anywhere on this map, on this globe map, um, and you will start to unravel more of it, and more of this uh, fog of war disappears and stuff. But there's little objectives everywhere. Uh, like each one of these dots is something something to collect or something to fight uh, but my mission is over there okay so let's go tackle that imp hive this is funny the little faces that are like you see their face their head and shoulders when they talk to you i love it it's really cool they're just like standing there but not moving what i think is hilarious is that no in every 
interpretation of the future, like this holographic kind of heads-up display thing, it's always with some kind of static or some kind of something that sort of, you know, manipulates the image so it's not working pristine. And I, I would think if that, that technology existed at all, if we had hyperspace technology, the first thing we're going to do is be able to s transmit signals you know, okay. in 8K quality or better. But in better, the logic you know? of the reason they're doing it is, is to show so you that, that you know they're not just there. Yes, that sure, there. yeah. But And also in the logic of the story, there's probably tachyon particles and subspace interference and... Okay. You know. I just always think it's weird. I guess, And it's also a nod to what Star Wars did as well with all of its rudimentary uh, communication. Yeah. Luke, Luke, you've George switched Lucas, off your targeting computer. George Lucas just did that, like with the static and the and the hologram in Star Wars, because yeah. it looks cool. Yeah, I know. That's the only reason he did. Well, and because he did that in THX 1138 as well. Yeah, for sure. And everybody that builds any communication technology in anything always does it too. Yet we are uh, reactivating dead uh, rovers on Mars right now. And in, in my research on. Uh, First man, I found out that a lot of the footage that was filmed by the um, the camera landing on the moon for the first time was in HD. Oh yeah. Yeah, they well, had. Well, they shot it on film. Well, they had um, uh, they had camera sensor technology that was just out of this world great, and they had no ability to transmit at that level. But uh, there's some incredible footage from the from the first land. And it's just sitting there on the uh, No, no, it's it's been brought back. I, I would imagine that it's well, on YouTube. Did they shoot it on film? I don't know. Because if you shoot it on film, that's better than HD. That's like the equivalent of 4K. I don't, I, you know, I'm not sure. Okay, so I blew up an imp hive. Glare's watch is a new location. We've got 27% of this planet is uncovered. And now... I like that the dinosaur is named Carl. should appear on your map. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and so now I can just keep going to these question marks. Oh, we got a super chat from Creed, or from uh, VR Grid saying, hey, VR Grid. don't forget about Creed. Oh yes, I won't, I will play Creed. I've got Call of Duty in the hopper, and hopefully I'm getting a code for Red Dead Redemption 2. Oh, uh, Adrian Leon is asking, uh, will you also be playing the Xbox One version of Call of Duty Black Ops 4? No, I'm only gonna be playing uh, PlayStation 4 version. Why is that? Because I've only got that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's a fair answer. <laughs> I, you know, I'm going to level up on that game. I don't think I'm going to have time to level up on both games. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, uh, what am I doing here? Oh, that's I gotta go blow up an extractor. Okay, you do this a lot. You gotta go blow up extractors, and you get some um, some cool doodads. Oh, there's some new, Matthew Winstone is asking new creatures. Can you can you just fly up whenever you want, or are you stuck to the ground? Right uh, my flight engines are disabled right now, but later I can. Yes, except if there's um, some some uh, some interference in the uh, sky, and they want to force you to be sort of ground based. Right now they're teaching you. I I would say. This is like 80% of the game, 80% of the mechanics is, is the planet exploration, okay. which is a little bit weird that they didn't let you A, hop out of the craft because you're on land so much, or B, give you a different sort of skew on the landing craft. And I'm wondering if that was part of the original design, like maybe these things transformed into, um, uh, you know, tired, uh, like things with tires or, or um, hover, yeah. hover jets or, or something like that. Or the Star Fox thing where it turns into like a ATAT -AT walker. Yeah, I'm wondering if, if that was part of the, the they initial They announced design. this a long time ago, didn't they? Like two years ago? 2016? Yeah, so yeah. that's like two and a half years ago they announced this. So yeah, I wonder if they were I'm sure the scope was like huge. That. They always are. Still, they accomplished a very, very big and ambitious project. Albeit with a lot of learning from watching other people try things, you know, like this, I don't know if this would exist quite like this without No Man's Sky coming out and watching that and going, whoa, that's too complicated, it's let's not do that. No Man's Sky yeah. inspired. Yeah, for sure. And also, you know, Disney Infinity and Skylanders. And yeah, like I said, this to me feels like a proof of concept for Beyond Good and Evil 2. That's what it feels like to me. It's fun scanning the, uh, it's fun just exploring the nooks and crannies of each one of these planets. You're gonna do a lot of the same stuff over and over. Every game has that, but it's just, the mechanics are fun, the ship's cool. You're scanning everything. Yep, and Why? then new discovery. It goes, it shows up in your, um, in your collection. So I've got all of these different things here. Uh, that just looks like a kid with a backpack. Which? <laughs> like it's just like a modern, like a present day kid. Yes. With like a backpack and a hoodie. Yeah. That's kind of weird. 
So but here's my question, Vic. If you're scanning everything, yes. why was the tie-in Star Fox and not Metroid? Oh, that would have been great, too. They could add. add... You're flying I around in Samus' ship right now. Well, Samus doesn't, isn't really a space shooter, though. Okay, so let's go blow up this thing here. I love these giant skeletons and stuff. This is gorgeous. It's really cool. Uh, Tyler Fisher, question. Any possibility of new EPN mug variants? Sizes, styles, etc. Yeah, I, I, I haven't had time to kind of think about new merch at all. And remember, we got the merch uh, store or the paid landing page open at epn.tv slash merch. That's the easiest way to kind of browse what, what we have built so far. But yes, um, I want to have new t-shirt designs. I want to have another coffee um, and some new different mug variants. Uh, just haven't had time, guys. Like we, uh, we're trying to get you content. <laughs> The content takes time. We played this part at E3. Yeah, you do a lot of this. Yeah. Complete. Siege so yes, there is a very good possibility. An and I know that people would Are dig uh, stuff that's just called Reviews on the Run or the Electric Playground as well. So trust me, it's, it's, it's in our minds. Um, and we will have news on that as soon as we can. Uh, here's, a, here's an interesting question from Tyler Doug. Yeah. Uh, question, is it not a bit crummy of Nintendo to only allow the Star Fox portion on the Switch? Uh, in the same way that Spider-Man's only playable on the PlayStation 4. Yeah, so is that, that would be crummy of Sony too. You know, when you think about it like... I mean, I never even thought of that, because like, well of course Star Fox is only on the Switch version. Yeah. You know, when you think of it, kind of put yourself outside of the game industry, like... Yep. Kind of would make sense for Nintendo. To that, that's why mobile's Nintendo. making so much money, guys. They don't have to think about any of that BS, you know. And if you, if you look up a game, if you look up a carrot, like if you are into Star Wars and you look up Star Wars, you're gonna get a lot of Star Wars on the mobile app store, you know. If you look up Spider Man, you're gonna have a bunch of Spider Man games. They're not great games. Some are some are okay, but. Uh, you know, mobile doesn't have anything, like, they don't have to worry about that at all. And it, it's the way it should be in the future, you know? It's the way it should be now. We shouldn't have these, these gates. Yeah, at the end of the day, Nintendo wants to drive Switches. They want to sell Switches. Yep. And you don't do that by letting your valuable IP on Sony or Microsoft's platform. Uh, I think you could. That's their logic. No, I, I agree with you, yeah. but I'm saying that's their thing. Yeah. I think you could, just like you... Uh, how That's you know you put your Animal Crossing on mobile, you're gonna get people interested in Animal Crossing yeah. as an IP, so. and they're gonna go to the Switch and get it. If they put Animal Crossing on the PlayStation 4, I think the same kind of thing would happen. Fascinating. Uh, Jordan Cunningham, question. Hey Vic. Yo. Are you gonna watch the new Halloween movie? Uh, I will watch it. I. Uh, when does it come out? Is it this next week? week? Next this week. week? Next okay. week. Okay. If it's this week. I think it's this week. Um, this I, I'm gonna find out about a screening. Probably right after we're done EP Live today, and then uh, try to coordinate with Johnny to see if Film Fury can go to that together. I mean, meaning both of us. Next week I'm out of town, um, but uh, yeah, I want to see that. I'm not a crazy horror film guy. I like The Quiet Place. I like good movies. <laughs> I don't like just scary stuff. The first Halloween is a good movie though. Yeah. John Carpenter knows it. You know, so I love I, John Carpenter. I don't know. I'm cautiously pessimistic about the new one because there have been a lot of shitty Halloween sequels. Yeah. But, I mean, this one, John Carpenter is producing it, and he's at a point where he doesn't need to be involved in something unless he wants to. Like, he doesn't need the money. He doesn't need anything. Like, if he chooses to be a producer on a film, like, it's because he genuinely wants to, which, to me, bodes well for the film. Okay, so here's what we do quite a bit. We, um... We pull plant, um, objects out of the sight. world like this. Like I'm picking up these plants called bone fruits, and they have That's to. Cool. And you you kind of tug back on the ship, and it pulls it out of the thing. So you do that a lot, and sometimes they're moving. Do you kind ever, of, is that is there a control the where you can like pull? No, them and honestly, I I should have said that in the review too. I think it was weird for there there to be such an elaborate way to attach the these pretty sizable toys to a controller and then not give kids the ability to fly the game like you can't flying. do that no i just assumed it's you all, could it's all uh, thumbstick why what is I the point i checked the game uh, the controls on the switch and when i handed the controller to my daughter i had to kind of teach her the right 
thumbstick is the camera, and I had to explain it in those terms. That seems so that's the way that you why, look. Why would you attach the thing to the controller if you can't do that? I, I, at least I don't think you can. Maybe there will be an update, or uh, you know, if somebody correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think you can fly the ships around like that. Part, it's a, it's an honest game. Like this is a, like yeah. you need to look around and fly everywhere and stuff. And if you were trying to do that like this, it would be really hard to play it. The that way seems that, crazy. There should be a mode at least where yeah. you can just fly the why ships. Why would like you that. attach the thing to the controller otherwise maybe so it's right there so you can swap it's pretty cool having the r-wing attached to my controller but at first i was like point? man that's big but and what's then I was the like, point if you're not i have the r-wing attached to my this is so cool oh hey i have a question and, and star fox on the inside it's so great about yes. that though when you the, the controller attachment thing for the switch is yes it for the the pro controller? No, the... I thought it was. It's actually, it, you take two of the Joy-Cons, and I guess they did that so that anybody that has any, you know, because you always get the two Joy-Con controllers yeah. with the Switch. So you take it off of your Switch, or if you have two extra ones, so you use those. design one that works with both? No. Well, that's weird. <clears throat> um, the other thing about this is that you're not really holding down. You can, you can charge... You can charge your weapons up a little bit and then send out a, a bigger shot, but you're doing a lot of tapping on the um, on the trigger buttons. And when I played the Switch game in portable mode, my fingers started to hurt. And honestly, my fingers started to hurt on even on the PlayStation 4 controller because you're doing a lot of this to to, to blast at everything. Um, but in portable mode on the Switch, it really started to get uncomfortable. But playing it on the Joy-Con uh, attachment thing, it felt fine. Played it for hours without any issues. But you are doing a lot of tapping. This is reminding me of Borderlands, this area that you're in. Yeah, because we're in the, uh, in the desert kind of deal. Okay, so you're, I'm freeing some of these bases and establishments and stuff like that as we go along the way. Oh, you know what? I can switch because this is digital. I can switch to any ship I want. So um, let's mod weapons. How do I do that? Uh, Blade Blur is asking when we're going to play Super Mario Party. Oh yes, we got to do that. When Nintendo says they won't flag us, no, 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 it. we got it's <laughs> it's just a it's a huge commitment, right? Like the sh the shortest ones are like an hour. It's a huge commitment. <laughs> uh, pilot skills. Let's see. Here we go. Playing Mario Party is like. How do I married. change? Th there is a way to change these things. Maybe I can't change in the middle of a fight. Oh, change loadout. Okay, so um, change. To this guy, why not? And we're gonna. I can change any of the wings that I want. So let's put this wing on, and let's put uh, that wing. So I have two different wings. I still have the weapons that I, I had before. Let's put any other weapon that I want. Let's put that one on. You can hear some of the sound effects on the uh, speaker on your PlayStation 4 controller as well. Um, and then let's put that one on there. Let's see what that does. Okay, and I'm going to change my character. Let's put um, let's put Levi in. Can you? Is this a thing you're supposed to be able to do? Putting the one ship thing on another one? Yeah, you can do. A, you you so can, can mix, mix and match, match any like any way that you want. Yeah. Can I put the gun on backwards like I just did? Yes, you can. Way? You can shoot behind you. And really? when I when I first set up one of the games, I was shooting behind me. I'm like, why am I not hitting anything? And it's, it was shooting behind me. It's because okay, you so, had the gun on wrong? Yeah. <laughs> and I have I have some mods here. I picked up some mods. So you can you stick, you stick some of these things in there. there a big chunk of time is going to be spent like Diablo-esque style. Oh, I put something else in there. Um, modifying your weaponry like this. So I've got weapon ammo. Oh, unequipable. How do I, how do I put the pilot in? Where do you uh, put the pilot in? The pilot goes in the bottom right here. You gotta, you gotta pull that thing out like that. Oh. See, it's a little sticky, a little tricky. It's not as... Oh, they probably don't want it falling apart. No. Oh, and then yeah, the pilot actually goes up inside. Yeah. So you can, they can see the, out of You the can see the oh, pilot, that's cool. yeah. That's cool. Okay. That's neat. Yeah, I, I know that if I were 10 years old right now, my mother would hate this game. Yeah. Because she would be waiting in line at Toys R Us to buy every little ship and thing. So I have a totally different ship. Totally different character, and I've modified the uh, the ship in physical construct, and also uh, modded the weapons and stuff. So you can see there's a lot of permutations, and then I've I'm gonna deliver an item right here. I mean, this is very tried and true RPG type gameplay. 
I'm upgrading the uh, um, the sensors or whatever stuff is going on here. And then he tells you about Nova. Isn't that from Guardians of the Galaxy? Uh, Nova Corps. Yeah, and the Nova is this awesome um, energy source that powers the... It's not the Elysium, what the hell was the ship called? Equinox. Equinox, thank you. Um, okay. I'll meet you there. Just have to find that darn assistant. So I oh, there's go. they even like have two different things on it, so you can. Okay. So now I can go out into space. You guys ready? Oh no, I can't. Yeah, Equinox. I need to get some fuel. I gotta fuel up the Equinox. There we go. So you'll see the Equinox has crash landed on this planet. Oh, there's your robot guy. I just noticed that. Yeah. That's cool. I like these toys. These are these are cool. Right? I they, might steal these from you, though. No, you're not. <laughs> They're gonna be all around me in my gaming nook. Uh, yeah, Ubisoft pulled it off. I'm very impressed. I'll be talking to those guys soon too, so stay tuned for that. Yeah, I'm really curious to see how well this sells. That's me too. That's gonna be the big question. That's gonna be a. Like, if this fails, you know, Vivendi could come after them again. No, they're not. <laughs> they're they're fine now. Do the pilots make a difference, or are they just yes, the yes, they do. I mean, it, it comes down to um, your your maneuverability and your weaponry and stuff, depending on the skills of the pilots. Okay, you're, okay. you're upgrading everything, like they'll just add firepower or defensive resistance or something like that. Um, and that's true of all the modifications for your ship and for your weapons as well. That's what you're kind of tuning. But uh, like I say, it would be great if you could pop out and get into some um, on foot <coughs> action as well, maybe for a sequel. So here's the big mothership, all crash landed. Is there collision damage? Uh, like you'll see it on like the ship? You, no. Crash your ship in a no, you'll just see that the like I'll, I'll, I'll fly into something. You can see that I get kind of hurt. You can tell you're screwed up. Does it? But could you destroy your ship though no. by flying into that? No. You just recover, and then your health regenerates. That's the the two little health bars down below. Okay, so we are here. We're going to upgrade the uh, Equinox. We're going to build the uh, core systems and. Nice. If we find any more goodies around here, maybe when did you we say can you upgrade the Equinox. Two thirty. Two thirty. Yeah. Yeah. Two thirty now. Let's see okay. if this works. Yeah. Are we done? It's a big game, and it's very fun. <laughs> and they did a they did a, a very good job putting all this stuff together. So he tells you we got this all working again, and then they get off into space, and then you go fly into space, and then you're jumping around between the different uh, the different planets and stuff. Super cool. Yubi, you did it. Okay, bye everyone. Yes. Okay, you guys. Uh, am I gonna live stream gameplay of uh, Call of Duty Black Ops 4? You know I am. Tomorrow, in fact, we're gonna play a little Call of Duty Black Ops 4 right here on EP Live. Uh, but that's gonna do it for us today, you guys. Thank you so much for watching, everyone. We'll be back again tomorrow with new content for you. In the meantime, check out the other material that we've built. Uh, let us know what you think of all of our stuff. Hit subscribe, hit that little bell if you dig us. And uh, don't forget you can uh, sign up and become an EPN member, which is kind of sponsoring the content, which we rock, uh, which, which rocks. And we have the EPN.TV merch page, which will send you to all the cool things that you can wear. And uh, it was rad to be at uh, the Vancouver Fan Expo and people were picking up the t-shirts and, uh, you know, wanted to say hi and all that stuff. It still blows my mind that people wear the EPN brand on their chests. It's very cool. Thank you guys for watching. We'll see you tomorrow. And until then, play forever.